after what we've seen yesterday, it was like a broad brush sort of uh, discussions about uh, quite a number of things which I do hope has set the scene in terms of how we want to proceed. But uh, I would also like to mention the, the point that I mentioned yesterday in terms of adapting the program to your needs within obviously the program that we already have. Uh, you, don't, you don't want me to do something which we were not expecting to do, obviously. But within the remit of the program, so we have we can adapt it to meet your expectations. So we're going according to the program itself. Uh, but within that, as I said, we can fine tune in terms of where we want to put emphasis. So having a set up sort of a scene at the global level, and then have sort of tried our level best to bring it to the Nigerian context in terms of how the external context via the globalized elements and obviously via your own internal liberalization process and makes you take opportunities in terms of what's happening elsewhere as a global player, but also how to reckon with the challenges that inevitably come with being part of a bigger group. Okay? So, and this is not in isolation because it's so much linked to what we are continuing to do. So today it's, uh, when, when you look at uh, the handout has been circulated, uh, that's again for your reference. Uh, I've put uh, as much uh, wide level of information as possible just to give you an idea uh, when we cover it uh, together now in terms of what this is all about. Uh, and I, if I could, I could probably double even the amount of material that I've given you there. Still would not have been enough because the macroeconomic context, you can link it, stretch it to the extent that you want. So I've sort, I've called it building blocks and then try to just touch upon each one of them. Try as we've, that we've, we've sort of, we've been doing yesterday bring up the linkages in terms of its relevance to Nigeria, but also more generally. And again, to reiterate that point yesterday is that uh, fundamentally, a lot of those accounting frameworks, a lot of those relationships, a lot of those links are not that different. So that's the positive news. It's not that uh, complicated. Uh, and obviously, the other point I would like to make before starting formally is uh, we have different type of uh, delegates here with different expectations uh, based on, for example, the way you reacted to the objective yesterday. So I do hope that uh, what we are doing today is relevant to all of you. So at some point, from my point of view, it was to try to bring a level playing field. So try to bring everybody up to that level. So that's the objective. But at some point, it might probably be boring for 70% of you. So if that's the case, then stop me, right? We can move faster into something else. So as I said, I'm quite flexible. It's not because I have 20 slides or 30 slides to finish that I want to finish. There's no need for that. This is a reference which you can use for, for those of you who are already expert into those areas. It's just a refresher. But those of you who want to delve deeper into it, so that's an opportunity to just to think about it now. It's a one-week course just to remind ourselves what it's all about. Right? So, so that's the context. So don't hesitate. Or, but by now, I hope we know each other, so you should be able to stop me and tell me to shut up. Or I, I don't mind. <laughs> um, right. So let's proceed then. So, like I said, the title is a building block. So basically, the essential components. If uh, I was, uh, if you were doing even a formal course in macro, they would probably not cover what I'm going to cover here, that, that, or that I'm trying to, to introduce here, because they would have concentrated on the core macroeconomic theory. And I'm not doing that. I'm taking the theory, but I'm trying to make it as practical as possible, but also link it to what in reality is about, from a Nigerian perspective, but from a world, global perspective, when we talk about macroeconomy, ma macroeconomic analysis, you can see that there are more than what the textbook would say, because they would not necessarily link it to like 
issues of MTech in that way. They're not going to link it to issues of public financial management in that way. They will just give you the four accounts and say this is macroeconomic uh, policy, this is macroeconomics, compare it to microeconomics. So we will do a little bit of that, but we want to, to make it something like a practical tool for you. Okay? So that's what this objective tells you here, the key elements of macroeconomic analysis from that point of view, not from a theoretical point of view, from a textbook point of view. Uh, that define, obviously, we have to define few things. Um, I may have yet already some a handout for you. Uh, it is always good to have something like a glossary. So but it's not always easy. Somebody say, well, what is FOB? What is CIF? What is this? What is PPP? Yesterday we were talking about. But I've just defined it in one minute, or less than one minute. But uh, it's always good to have it somewhere. So you will have an electronic version which you can keep on your own machine. So whenever you're looking at it, because sometimes even uh, journal like uh, the economist, the World Economic Outlook, etc., they assume a lot that when, when you're reading a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, they already assume that you are already a practitioner. Obviously, you are a practitioner, but it doesn't mean that you're always using the job on, on a day-to-day -day basis because you're using what is relevant to you. But suddenly, some, some, sometimes a new thing to just come up. Or maybe that I was telling you about the, I checked this G20 meeting I was mentioning. So it, was, it hasn't yet started. It's going to be, I think, next week. So it's definitely China. And uh, so it's going to happen. But I will mention the G20. So in case I, you might think that I'm giving the wrong information, no, it hasn't started. But it's happening. So they are preparing it now. So that's why I thought I knew, though, because the time was coming for the G20 to, to, to happen. So it's a good idea, maybe one of your, uh, when you go back home, maybe to say, well, okay, we talked about this, so let me pay attention to it. In view of the fact that Nigeria is an observer, so it's, it's not really economics anymore now. Economics together with something else. That's what the reality is about. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that a little bit today. So look at issues like economic growth, macroeconomic stability, and so obviously within the macroeconomic framework. So look at some other parameters that may not necessarily be, like I said, in the textbook. So zoom in a little bit about this public financial management I mentioned yesterday. I personally, I mean, I would think that all of you, if you are not yet, if you're already an expert into that, so that's good, very good. Uh, public, public financial management should be something that you should know very well. And that would really give you a very good indication about how did those people who are sending you that report about uh, the MTEF, etc. So it's not only the macro aggregate, but did they actually do their job to the nitty gritty? So the public financial manager goes into the whole process of how the government is really or not really managing its public finance. So it goes into quite a lot of areas, right? Even going to, for example, what we call procurement reform, let's start off with, or the budgetary process. How is the budget being constructed? So at least from your point of view, you may not be the one involved on budget, but sometimes it gives you an idea about how, where probably the problem is when they have given come up with a figure. You already told me yesterday that when you were all doing the mapping, a lot of things came up. So that to some extent would not should not be a surprise to you if you understand the public So that that we will touch a little bit within the time that we have. This, give you a flavor about what it's involved, uh, especially in view of the fact that the financing of Nigeria's requirements are all changing. Because in the, if you look at what you were getting or what you were using 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and what you are using now in terms of resources, in terms of sources of finance, you find that it's changing, right? People are talking about infrastructure bond, people are talking about diaspora bond, people are talking about international capital market, which you never went, etc. While in the old days it was always about bilateral loans, uh, multilateral loans, IDA loans, etc., etc. Um, but these have changed now. So how do you actually get yourself prepared to ensure that whatever economic management policy is coming up to you when you're reviewing it, at least you're understanding it and your question, is Nigeria up to speed in terms of taking those new sources of financing, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so we'll do a little bit about that. So within this public financial management, that's where we're going to situate. I always like to situate the budget within the PFM. And I do hope this is a key message you'll take back home. Uh, and obviously, we'll mention a little bit about this medium-term fiscal framework and MTEF. 
because to, to show you with the vision, vision that I mentioned yesterday. So put it a little bit more, a bit more coherent today. So like I said, it's a building block. So introducing, but not only introducing, but discussing a little bit within the time that we have. Okay. And then um, I'll, I've taken the liberty here. I don't know whether they are, this is going to be useful to you. So show you some aggregates, some uh, identities, some. I would say equation, but some relationship in the form of what we mean by closed economy and open economy. It's a very simple one, which you probably are, you're going to find very useless. But I left it there because I didn't know the objectives, which I was simplifying yesterday. It's not simplifying, but it's the SDGs, you know, all those indicators, all those uh, that comes now and the, sort of the, 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 the new development indicators that have been agreed uh, last year. So economic growth is a single most important factor. So it's not me saying that. I mean, despite the fact that a lot of uh, people have been questioning the relationship between economic growth and poverty reduction, but the reality is that you still need to grow because uh, otherwise the money, the resources that you have will not be enough to actually meet your social objectives. So it's the single most important factor influencing poverty, creating wealth and improving living standards. So there are three things there. I'll put poverty number one, it's up to you to decide which one is more more important than you. So I have poverty number one, and number two upset creating wealth, and number three upset improving living of standards. And they're all interlinked, right? These are three sort of, already you're, you're looking at objectives now. If for example, I would, I'm not going to ask you, but if I was going to ask you, what is the objective of economic policy making in Nigeria? I mean, that a number of elements will come to your mind, must come to your mind, because you're doing your analysis something that you do on a daily basis, you should be able to know. Yeah. You can bring it to a micro level. So that's the type of thought that I'm, I'm trying to, well, we're discussing now. We're all together right on that. So it's all about, what is it? Why am I doing this analysis? I'm trying to do, why is Parliament asking me to do that job? Why is the report coming to this? So it's always a high level objective. So you could have the primary objective, secondary objective, third, 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 third tertiary objective, but you still need to know why you are doing that. There can't be somebody say, oh, we are growing because we have to grow, we don't have a choice. I mean, that, that, that's, that's not convincing enough. It's, there must be an objective. There must be something why you want to do. And I believe that this is the same thing for all of us. Our own life, personally, we have an objective. It's not because you were born that you are supposed to say, well, when you reach 18, you are supposed to go to work. That's not the idea. There's always some objective there. The objective change, and in government also, those objectives do change because, and sometimes you know that I made a mistake, so I have to correct it. So it's always fine tuning. That's what I say. I don't never say mistakes. I say fine tuning, learning from past experiences and try to get on the right track. So these are the types of issues that economy is about. There's no magic formula whereby it is a straightforward line. Economic growth, I want to move from here to here. No. That's the theory. That's the textbook. They simplify it. But in reality, you're going to see that we need to be very much agile and be flexible in terms of whatever we are uh, proposing or analyzing or going. Okay? So macroeconomic stability. For me, that's a very big important. Again, like I said, I'm not doing it training in macroeconomic here, so I'm going to just introduce those sessions and then have some discussion. Remember, don't uh, stop me if you want to have a discussion on the capital market. Remember that discussion? And they put that money and, they were, and the minister was very proud to say that when well, our level of reserves have gone up thanks to that borrowing, which was it's an objective. Anyway. Uh, what indicate macroeconomic instability, so that's easier to explain, when GDP is stagnating, is declining, so you already know this is the easiest one. The GDP is not growing, so certainly there is some, some problem there. It could be very short term, but sometimes it can be very structural, right? And it can unfortunately happen that growth is not picking up at all, despite all the efforts of the government, despite all the efforts of the private sector coming in, right? Uh, so, so GDP is stagnating or declining, that's worse. Um, large current account deficit, uh, financed by short-term borrowing, which is the most dangerous way of doing things, uh, high growing public debt, uh, which we're going to talk about later, but we have already touched a little bit about that, the implication of having too, too high a debt, 
because this is so directly linked to your bread and butter, which is the budget. Uh, unfortunately, in many countries, until now, in a lot of countries were thinking that they were not linking those, the debt management or the public debt with the budget. It was always considered to be two separate things. But luckily nowadays, people all understand, but it's all core to that. Because if you are running a budget deficit, then your public debt is going to go by itself. And that even, even whether you want it or not, this is the relationship. Like in the old days, we were talking about, oh, the government has been reckless, they've gone out, they borrowed on capital projects, etc. It's true, but it's linked to basically what you want to do with your budget. I mean, obviously, like we said, the budget is there to present. It's an annual plan. But luckily, nowadays, when we discuss it, you see, but you know it already, this medium term perspective of how you want to move. So, this is why having too much I mean, debt that we saw yesterday can lead to all the challenges that we mentioned yesterday. And obviously inflation is something that we don't want to see. Um, I still go around and see that in the countries, when I analyze them, you see that double digit figures of inflation seems to have become the norm. And that should not be the norm. Because you're, you may not necessarily see it. People accept it, probably say, oh, we're used to having a high level of inflation. But it's doing the damage. So this is something that one again needs to look at. And obviously, the other side of it is, uh, if you have instability, is, uh, I wasn't, as I said, I wasn't aware of whom I was going to talk, so I've given both sides so that everybody can understand it. Um, you could see this illustration, your per capita GDP is growing consistently. Uh, you know what is per capita GDP, right? So I'm going to give you some, uh, when we do the real economy, so there will be something there in terms of the formula, but, uh, you know, so it's all your, your GDP divided by your population. Uh, inflation under control, single digit, so it's pretty much what you want. Um, you will see that the new way of looking at it, I'm not sure, I haven't read the, the remit of the Central Bank of Nigeria, but you would see that increasingly, even in our own countries now, they are required now to keep the inflation low, but also because they are gradually becoming a bit more independent. They have to do every, obviously they have to support the government requirements. You, don't, you can't have a central bank that's doing its own thing in isolation. But having said that, so you will see that if inflation is not under control, like in the case of the UK and some other places, they will have to come and write a letter to the Minister of Finance to explain why did you fail this type of thing. So it's making it like inflation has to be, and normally they have this threshold in some places where around 2%. When the EU came up, this was a good model to look at. They had put inflation target, public debt target, a lot of other targets pretty clear. So sometimes I don't like target myself because it's sometimes very rigid. So when we were talking about yesterday, you were asking the question about what is the ideal level. I was I I didn't try to uh, move away from it, but usually target is uh, very subjective in the sense that it's just a physical level without taking into account of so many other things taking place. And we're talking about economy here; they're, they're dynamic, right? But sometimes you need those targets because countries sometimes will not adhere. And I remember I went to a, to a number of countries. One in particular was telling me that uh, we were doing their public finance and the public debt law. So I was reviewing it and I had removed the target. But those targets was, were useless. So I'm saying that I don't like the target in the law. They pleaded, they say, you know, you are asking for trouble in this country. This country only works by rule. If you remove this target, I was explaining to them this target is useless because it changes. It will change immediately. So why do we put the target within the law? Put the target in the uh, in, the subs in the secondary legislation. You know there's primary legislation and then secondary legislation. So you put it there, then you evaluate it. But you still put it there that you have to comply within clear remit guidance, etc. But they insisted on putting it in law because they say that our politician or even our policy makers, nobody is going to accept if it is not cast in stone. So at the end of the day, reluctantly, we put it there. And guess what? Every year they have to go to the to Parliament to change the law. I said, I told you so, but 
that's what you wanted because it was being it wasn't working. So they had to go and amend it every time. Those accounts have to be sustained. So I don't want to say balance, but to sustain. That's what the organizers would always have to do. Not just to say, well okay, that's government wants to achieve that, so let's go for it. So underlying that this stability is there. Okay? Though it is not normally mentioned in, in, in many instances it won't be mentioned. But in your mind, the stability has to be there. So countries like Nigeria would aspire to achieve a stability, which is the bedrock, which is the foundation to support economic growth and create an environment for private sector to develop in this country. Because that's what the, everybody is looking. When a standard and poor come to your country externally, you know who they are. Those rating agencies, they do come, and Fitch, others, they come and do a rating, a rating, right? Moody's, you know what? Um, they are looking, in fact, they are looking at how stable is your economic structure. Without you knowing, they have about 30 or 40 indicators which they are using to actually assess. And can I tell the people who are going to use my data? Meaning, uh, those data are used, right? Those ratings are being used by investors. Somebody wants to come and invest in your country. So many use, many, many uses of the ratings of the investors. So they're doing that analysis, stability. A private sector, and if you go back to what I was talking to you yesterday, why should I come to Nigeria? What are you doing that makes me interested to put my money in Nigeria? These are the types of questions they are asking. This is not a question that you, when you're looking at your economic analysis or your fiscal deficit, comes up. But that's the type of answer at the back end of your mind you're analyzing. So it's a high level. Again, I'm not compl complicating your life here, but I'm just saying that the analysis is not done in a vacuum. It's so easy for me just to have told you that economic analysis is just easy. Just look at the figures and just look at the growth rate and then just analyze it. No. There are more to it than economic, you know what I mean? So, and that's what the fundamental the analysis is about. Is what is it really achieving? And that's when you look at it, then you see a different dimension. Just think about when you're right, you're reading an Article 4 report or even your own report when you're looking at this report. Oh, that's what we're trying to achieve. And then, obviously, consistency. Not only one budget, the second budget, the third budget. Is there some consistency that the wider public, the investors say, oh, yeah, this government knows what it's doing. Oh, the government is aware there are challenges. So I'm not saying that's always plain selling everything. No. We all, as government, as policymakers, as uh, working in government, you're always going to face challenge. But what the investor, what the outside world, what internally your private sector would require is that those guys know. Know they are problems and they're trying to address it. Yeah? That's the time. So the confidence that we are taking action. Obviously, earthquake, bad, bad development. You can't do anything about it. But even then, people say, well, how are you reacting to that? Remember yesterday, I was talking fiscal space. Do you have enough fiscal space to actually react? So that's, uh, you, you're supposed to produce that report, let's say, by the end of the week. But the, in terms of the deadline, the tighter deadline, they say. That's the theory, I'm not saying. But that's the perception, that because you're, you can work inefficient. But you will still do the work. But you can take double the time, three times the time to do the work. But Sometimes we don't realize, taking three times, taking four times, that's where the productivity comes from. The per unit cost of doing a report, of doing, of producing something, of giving that form, any work, right, has a cost. There's no free lunch in life, you know. I don't believe there's any sort of free lunch. Even when somebody, a private sector comes to you, there's no free lunch. They want something from you when they come. So no free lunch. So when you are doing it, so don't think that there is no cost. There is always a cost. So that's productivity. How productivity will be good? Because your revenue is never as to what it should be, given the growth rate that you're talking about. It's pretty good rate, but you're not getting anything to invest more. Yes. I, I think just to portray what you added also, we were there around 2012-2013, where uh, a particular committee of the parliament discovered that you require 123 signatures at the ports to clear, to have your books cleared. Mm -hmm. While in Antwerp and Rotterdam, you don't need a signature. Just six 
you know, kind of entries through a terminal and you clear your goods. And that was actually what propelled the reforms in the port, in the, the Nigerian Post Authority. Yeah. Yes. And that makes it very clear because the Finance Committee, then in conjunction with Marine Transport and the Federal Ministry of Finance, realized that the revenue is, you know, isn't really coming as it's supposed to, the customs and excise, and then they tied it down to, you know, those kind of uh, delays and processing, and then the congestion of the ports also. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of containers, but that was there that they gave more than 500 cars to the National Assembly members and so forth. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was a real issue before, about 123 signatures to just, you know, no. kind of clear your hoops, but now, Things are in the matter of maybe 48 hours now, you get your things in. Exactly. Yeah. So, no, it was really affecting revenue, it was really affecting it will, it will implementation be. of the budget. Yeah. Exactly, because yeah. sometimes you might think, Oh, we're talking about customs, so why am I talking about customs? But I'm talking about your own fiscal because yeah. you're asking this revenue for agencies because the one that's generating revenue, you are not going to get revenue when, where you are, you are expecting. The so Ministry of Finance expect a lot from them, right? So that's the, the customs, then you have your taxation. So, but if there are leakages, if the system of filling a form and providing, paying your taxation, so because sometimes you have this thin uh, tax in, uh, identification number, it's so dodgy, it's not well organized, going on the website, fail, you wait for two hours to actually register, all these type of things. And uh, or if it's a manual system, so, the, that's what I'm talking about, the leakages. And the more leakages there are, the less money you're getting. Mm -hmm. So that's your start of your problem, anyway. So when you talk about fiscal management, you're not even getting what you're deservedly generated. The government needs that money. They can't get it. So, so, so it's asked, anybody is aware, is this budget doing enough to support the SDGs? You to say the right? And, and that's the type of analysis you do. So and this, this slide is about that. Is, that's, that's, the, that's the government remit. Economic growth, yes. But the, what's somewhere where the government can do is create that environment, create that social safety net, and give the confidence to the poor, give the confidence that you will be given the support to get out of the poverty trap. That's what we're doing. You're not trying to give them a freebie for life. I don't believe in giving support for life. That means that you're creating a culture of support, which is dangerous. Then people would, would if the, the children back, the children, the children, children will say, oh, we live on benefits. My father lived on benefits. So we, we are, I'm not going to be a politician. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not, I can't afford to go to school. And suddenly now this vicious uh, circle of being poor remains. Poor. No, it's about giving them the opportunity. For me, this is about poverty reduction, creating that opportunity. Giving them. This is why the SDG is very complex, uh, but, but if you bring it down to what Nigeria can do, you'll find there are so many things you can do to build on your MDGs. So that's another, another thing that you need to look at. It's clearly within the government. So one should be proud to say, yes, this budget is pro poverty reduction. So it's doing enough there to ensure that, yes, there can be growth. More growth means more money to support the poor, but also there are policies there that is pro support of poverty reduction. And then there is an internal balance, and then there is external balance. That's the generic one. Every macroeconomic objective would achieve that. We want some form of growth. Obviously, there's economic and social objectives, but you want growth. But you also want some internal balance and external balance. Then when you take those objectives, you put it in practice, you might find that, obviously, uh, under your vision, under your budget, under your economic strategy, under your fiscal framework, what a document. We're going to see some of them. Those documents, will, somewhere there should be some stable policy. We have decided that we want to achieve growth. And you can go further than that. I want to achieve a level of growth. I don't know for Nigeria. On average, what is the level of target growth that one is expecting? Five, six percent? That's a plus two percent. But for this year, it's one point three, seven point two percent. That's the achievement. Or is it the expectation? No, the expectation. 
Now, but that's for yeah, profit. But for what is the overall, the overarching objective? Of, so that must be something around the five percent, or something acceptable. That's your immediate objective. This is based on reality. So when you're doing your forecast, based on all the assumptions that you've got, in view of the what is happening, some of the uncertainty. So you say that I think this year we should be able to achieve about four point three, right? And notice that. But generally, is it like four, five percent, five percent, six percent? I think initially, previous years, the target improved level of up to about seven percent. So that's that's seven percent. Yeah. Right. So that's more a medium term objective. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'm talking about. But obviously, you would have your annual target because that's the reality. You made your forecast, uh, and obviously, something is not. So there are some downside risks that they have probably in there. I don't know what was the growth uh, last year, so then it was five. So that was a downside risk. So economic growth is a macroeconomic objective. Then the content of inflation. So I'm saying just content inflation. If you translate it into Nigeria, you're going to see here the central bank has a particular objective. So either to maintain inflation absolutely, or even to say that inflation would be brought down. Let's say inflation was very high in Nigeria in general. Then we would normally say I want to do inflation. I want to do my level best to bring it to single digit. On the other hand, if it was already single digit, then there's no point of saying, I want to bring it down to single digits. It's already single digits. Then you would say, I want to bring it to maintain or to bring it down further to a certain level which is acceptable based on obviously interest rate of the So sometimes you say, well, you level of 4 or 5%. Like I say, in the UK and some other places, 2%, something like that. Certainly, inflation under control. Okay? And uh, limit budget deficit to certain level. Um, I, I had the opportunity to look at, for example, what the you're talking about fiscal consolidation. So there's already within your budget, I was reading, when we have a chance to look a little bit about your own budget, you will see that there, that yeah. there are, um, at least the intention there is to do something about bringing down the budget deficit. Okay. And that's usually if the imbalance is too much, so something must be done. Right? So now obviously is your job would be, and the members of parliament would expect you to do, is how much of that is achievable, or is it just rhetoric? As you know, budget speed sometimes can be very rhetoric. You're not filming me, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I'm not saying about Nigeria. But it's true. A lot of that is to convince people. But sometimes it's good to have a good intention. If I turn it around, somebody who doesn't have a vision would never be able to achieve much. You agree with me? Yeah. You need to have some aspiration. Sometimes it has happened to me, to my kids and to my nephews, etc. They come up with some very crazy ideas. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I would just say, well, you're not dreaming. Mm -hmm. Or cuckoo or whatever. And then I suddenly I say, well, what am I saying? This guy is thinking seriously. Mm -hmm. And there are people like the Bill Gates of this world. Oh, of course. The, what is his name? This guy who died, the, the founder of Apple. Apple, yes. I mean, Steve Jobs. All those founders of Facebook and others. I mean, they Mark started Zuckerberg. something. You would never have thought that by just creating something like a social media. Who knew about social media? My time, also, you didn't have a phone. You didn't know a telephone. First mobile phone I got was, oh my God, this is amazing. Nothing else. This phone. Yes. And so, so aspiration. So sometimes it may work, it may not work. So, so sometimes in government also, you want to achieve it. Obviously, then you have to dedicate time, resources, to actually become. Unfortunately, sometimes in, in, in our type of government, is that five years they think they are in government, but then they don't follow it further. And we know nowadays that growth is not short term. Changing the structure of an economy is about long term. So that's another thing in your analysis. Though you are analyzing the annual budget, that analysis in your mind, you should be linking it to the last year's budget and to the future. We need consistency. You can't change your budget objective overnight. Obviously, you're reacting to the reality. That's okay. But fundamentally, there must be some objectives which are there. Within those budgets, there must be some underlying objectives that you want to achieve. And that is why the beauty of an MTEP, etc., at least make that possible a bit. Because the MTEP is, the title itself is 
medium term expenditure framework. So medium term fiscal framework. That's where you're doing a bit of fiscal. Forget for one minute the annual budget, which is just cutting it down into annual plan, but your medium term fiscal framework is already telling you that's my expected resource allocation, availability, that's much has that's that's what those sectoral ministries want to happen. How do we marry that together? Then how do we break it break it down into the plan? So that's what you do. So that's so that's that's how your analysis should be. An annual budget should not be analyzed in isolation from the overall over, overall plan. Otherwise, you're just doing mechanically. You're just saying, oh yes, we've analyzed it. But you should be saying that the longer term objectives or the medium term objectives of the government must be respected within this year's budget. I would like to say that. I, mean, I don't know, maybe you're doing it already. Uh, sometimes I'm saying something that you already know, but it's quite important to do. Okay, I think just to comply with what I've said, 2020. Let's break now. We're supposed to do something. And then, so let's take our break and then come back. Okay? An issue there. Well, you're perfectly in your space to actually say so, if you feel. Uh, the case. And another one would be something about uh, keeping credit and money supply under control, which to some extent is about uh, interest rate. Uh, it's the monetary sector. And I keep mentioning that this is not something that you could just leave it aside. This is also part of the macroeconomic setup. A lot of those uncertainty, a lot of those challenges, a lot of the risk would some, sometimes be not necessarily coming from the fiscal side, it may be coming from the monetary side. Yeah? So, you know, so these are just indications of the type of objectives you'll be looking at. And uh, in the analysis, you need a target, which, as I said, you know it already, but I am, I am, I'm supposed to say it. So, so that's about objectives. We will, you're going to see that every time we're going to talk about in, a new sector or a new type of analysis within the macro uh, analysis of Nigeria, I will keep coming to the objectives because this is so important. You know, the, primary objectives, secondary objectives, etc. And we may even, um, we have some some documents which uh, Mr. Nasir has kindly forwarded to us, uh, to me. I know we could look at it. I have also a couple of copies of the Article 4 agreement to try to find out the type of analysis which uh, IMF does. So that in terms of what yourself you're looking at. And there's no harm in, in checking what others are doing on, in your country. But well, this is perfectly normal because uh, everybody is doing analysis, like I mentioned yesterday, the ADB, etc. So sometimes it's good just to check what they do. Not necessarily to check whether they are right or wrong, but sometimes just to ensure that what angle are they looking at. You know, you may be having a looking at it from a from a parliamentary point of view. You're giving them uh, because as part of their oversight role, they're doing it. But sometimes there may be some other angle to look at. So, so that, so that, but I will always come back, come to that. Start my and our discussion with the objective is always important. What are you trying to achieve? Is that doable or not? Because, like I said, economic growth, that's it, yes. What is the purpose? What is my long term? What is my medium term? <coughs> so that's a bit so far. I'll park a little bit now in terms of the macro. I'm giving you a bit of some, some of the building blocks. So let's move on some sort of as a parallel issue related to what you do. Uh, like I promised you. Uh, so I'm bringing it now for the first time in a formal way. This concept of uh, public financial management. And like I say that this is, should be technically a bread and butter for you as well. Because uh, I cannot imagine when you're doing looking at public finance, when you're looking at the way money is received, when the, money, the way money is spent, you can't look at the public financial management, right? So again, I may not be saying anything new to you because you already know that. Because we've been talking a little bit of the, about those components, cash management, TSA, if miss, GIF miss, whatever it is. So they're all part of that. And your budget, obviously, is very much within that framework. So as usual, you'll see something on that slide. It's, uh, this is from the IMF. Um, um, they're very good in terms of proposing this accounting framework, which you are, you are adopting. UN, those international agencies, I mean, 
we are members of that. Of them. So basically, they are developing those frameworks for us to use, right? So I've, I've taken the liberty of using what they have rather than, because this is all available. Like I said, that's the UN system, system of national account, your statistical deposit is already using that. So this one is a framework which I, which from the financial programming. I'm going to refer to them quite a lot because you might, <coughs> it's, it's pretty simple to, to, to explain also. So public financial management is about the effective management of collection, uh, management of collection and expenditure of funds by companies. So this is simple. You're talking about on one side, there's always a balance on the left, on the right, on the debit, on the credit, on credit, debit, whatever. So on one side, you need money, so you are getting, you are receiving funds, and on the other side, you're spending those funds. And how good, well are you using it? And that's essentially what is public financial management. It goes deep into it. There's so many things you're going to see, but the budgetary process is core to it. And immediately, without going into the details, you can see here. So some of the components that you analyze, so those, when you're analyzing your budget, you're already looking at that, right? You mentioned you were doing a lot of those mapping about the capital projects here. So you see the capital expenditures there. The other expenditure are split up on this particular slide, the concept of interest and other expenditure, because interest is something which needs to be looked at separately when you're doing your analysis. Usually it's part of your, your, your recurrent there. And then obviously your revenue, the different sources of revenue, depending on the type of structure, the type of economy you have. We'll come back to that. And then, obviously, if your revenue and your expenditure are not matching, so obviously that generates a deficit, and that deficit is, uh, let's say, borrow, blah, 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 over a deficit, and then borrow, etc. So that's the public financial management. 